there everyone keep seven gaming here back with another magic the gathering arena video uh, and today we are going over my core set 2021 crafting guide so uh, essentially what this means is i'll be going over every rare and mythic in the upcoming core set 2021 uh, and we will be kind of reviewing how many copies of each rare and mythic or of each respective rare and mythic card uh, i think you should craft you know when it launches um two weeks after launch so kind of when the meta settles we'll go over kind of you know maybe we'll go over each card again and see how many uh copies at that point i think you should craft and then at the end of the set so you know once once rotation happens sometime in you know three months from now i think in the fall september or october we'll revisit uh we'll revisit course at 2021 and see kind of how many we think overall you should have had at the end or maybe how many you should have moving forward once the meta you know entirely settles before rotation um so for the for for the crafting at launch i'm going to probably be a little bit more conservative i don't want obviously everybody spending their wild cards on a bunch of garbage uh that's going to be pointless after two weeks uh once i think two weeks happens i think the meta will settle probably a little bit after two weeks barring any further bans or suspensions or anything like that um, I think two weeks is a safe amount of time for people to have figured out what's good, what's bad, uh, and I think we'll probably be a little bit more aggressive after two weeks, and then in the final outcome, obviously, we'll see how right and or wrong we were. Um, <clears throat> I'll leave a link into the description for this actual Google Doc. Uh, you'll be able to go in, you'll be able to see uh, each one of the rares, mythics. I have a copy um, of a picture of each of the cards. I have the name of the card, uh, a picture of the card, and then we have the rarity here, just so we can kind of sort by... Uh, the rarities i have them uh, by their colors so i have white blue black red multicolored lands artifacts you know you get it green um so yeah uh, so column d is do i think you should launch uh craft it at launch and then the amount you should craft at launch and then we have the week two craft should you craft it after week two and then the amount and then we'll have the final crafting amount so how many you know once once everything's all said and done how many you should should craft once the set is kind of over and everything is rotating we're going into the next set which i think is is it zendikar or something not sure anyway so yeah let's get started so we'll start in white with the rare card containment priest i'll open each one just so you can kind of get a reference for what the card is um, otherwise you know you can just go to wizard's website and look at these cards i will put a link in the description to wizard's website where you can see all of the core set 20 and 21 cards um, but for you know for purposes of following along we'll just open each one you can kind of get a reference for what what card i'm talking about and we'll go from there so containment priest one in a white it's a creature with flash if a non-token creature would enter the battlefield and it wasn't cast exile it instead it's a two two i think this card is going to be pretty popular but i think people are going to figure out how to play against it pretty quickly um or play around it i should say uh i'm gonna go with a conservative approach here and say zero for this one I'm going to say don't craft this until the meta, meta settles. If the meta settles and this is a really powerful card and people haven't figured out how to play against it, maybe, you know, two weeks in, if, if that's the case, we might go all four. Uh, but for the sake of, you know, just starting out, I don't think that that's a card that you're going to be incorporating into every, every deck. I don't think that that would be something you probably want to spend your wild cards on at the very beginning. Again, we're going to be very conservative on that first week because we don't know what's going to be garbage and what's not. Um, I think here we're pretty much going to, we'll, we'll see, but anyway, the next card is Baneslayer Angel, it's a 5 mana, 3 and 2 white, angel creature, it has flying, first strike, lifelink, protection from demons and dragons, and it's a 5-5. Five, five. Um, this is a 0. This card is, is not going to be a player at all. Um, I doubt I'll eat my words on that, but next is Basri Ket, it's 3 mana, 1, a white and a white, legendary planeswalker. Um, I've talked about this in some of my other videos. I think this card isn't bad. A three mana planeswalker with three starting loyalty. His plus one is put a plus one plus one counter on up to one target creature. It gains indestructible until end of turn. Uh, that plus one plus one counter stays. It's not till end of turn. It just gains indestructible until end of turn. So that's pretty good. Whenever one or more non-token creatures attack this turn, create that many one one uh, soldier creature tokens that are tapped and attacking. His minus six. You get an emblem with at the beginning of combat on your turn. Create a one one white soldier creature token and then put a plus one plus one counter on each creature you control. So that's pretty powerful. Um, I don't think this card is that bad. I think there are a lot of decks that this could potentially see play with, um, and I think there's a lot of possibilities. So I would say this is a solid. You you can craft one of these and probably be safe. Um, use one mythic on this and I think you'd be fine. 
Um, you know, obviously if you're making a, a deck that kind of centers around white weenies, creating one, one tokens and, and beefing them up, you know, building wide and then building tall with counters and stuff like that, this card is going to be fantastic. But those cards aren't really strong in the meta, so you know it'd be like if if you're just kind of goofing around, you want to make a, a strong white weenie deck, this would be a good addition. But I'm not going to tell you to go out there and craft four of them because I don't think that he's going to be super strong in the meta. I mean, he he has some synergy with Winota, um, I think, in that you can just create tokens for her to get the triggers. But um, I don't think you should go out there and craft all four because I don't think he's going to be uh, you know a day one hit planeswalker i think maybe after two weeks we'll see where he is but as of you know at launch i think you'd be safe if you crafted one and he'd be you know it'd be useful you could throw him in a white weenie deck but um you're not i would not recommend going out crafting four of them and putting in putting him in a white weenie deck because you know it, it could be garbage but i think it's pretty good so i think you'd be safe crafting one if you just want to kind of play around with it and go from there next is Bosri's lieutenant it's a four mana, three and a white human knight creature with vigilance and protection from multicolored. When he enters the battlefield, put a plus one, plus one counter on target creature you control. Whenever Bosri's lieutenant or another creature you control dies, if it had a plus one, plus one counter on it, create a two, two white knight creature token with vigilance. And he's a three, four. Um, who, yeah, he's a, he has a lot of synergy, obviously, with, um, with the planeswalker. Um, and again, I guess if you're playing that style, if you're playing the token, you know, white weenie token style with adding plus one, plus one counters and all that, he'd be a solid addition. So we'll go one here as well, just because I guess if you are going to craft the Basri, you can make a lieutenant and they, they'd have some synergy just immediately. Um, again, obviously if you're making the white weenie decks and stuff, you're going to want f probably four copies of both and get that like really solid synergy between the two of them but um but I'm, again i'm not going to tell you to go that that deck a white we uh you know a mono white weenie deck is not going to be in i don't believe is going to be top tier meta deck so you know if you go out there and you want to play around and and do that that's fine but uh i wouldn't waste your wild cards on it so maybe you craft one i would say zero to one to be honest um yeah i would say zero to one you know, if, if you want to craft one, if you want to craft one Basri, it, I think it wouldn't be the worst thing in the world to craft one Lieutenant for, for, you know, to kind of tag along. Glorious Anthem. So this is a three mana, uh, one and two white enchantment creatures you control get plus one, plus one. I'm going to, I'm going to put this as a one as well. Um, I think that this could have a lot of, uh, effectiveness in a lot of different kinds of decks especially again the i think the basri in a basri's lieutenant like your your mono white weenies deck all of your one ones become two twos or something like that um and you know anything that you've been pumping up with those plus one plus one counters becomes that much stronger uh so i think it would be a safe one craft um again you know because mono white weenies is mono white weenies it's i don't think it's ever going to be top tier meta but or at least i don't think it's going to be top tier meta during the core set during this core set 2021 expansion uh, but it is a fun deck to craft and play and play around with so um, again i think it'd be a safe inclusion in that sort of deck but i wouldn't go out crafting all four you know between these three cards that's four eight that's 12 wild cards don't spend 12 wild cards here but you, you, i think it'd be safe to sp spend one on each of these and, and kind of make your mono white weenie deck that much you know more powerful or that much more fun Next is Idol of Endurance. It's a three mana, two and a white artifact. When it enters the battlefield, exile all creature cards with converted mana cost three or less from your graveyard until it leaves the battlefield. And then for one and a white, you can tap it until end of turn. You may cast a creature spell from among those cards exiled with uh, Idol of Endurance without paying its mana cost. That's really interesting. I haven't seen this card yet. Kind of like a pseudo Luris, right? You may cast a creature spell from among the cards exiled without paying without paying its mana cost. And with Luris, don't you have to pay their mana cost? Interesting. So this is like a pseudo Luris. Same same price, three mana. I'm gonna say zero for this, but I could see this becoming I mean this is just like a Luris. Well, it's an artifact and not a creature 
And Lur I think Lurus is just better because Lurus, you actually have a body on the field that does more or less the exact same thing. Lurus is two or less, if I recall. Is it two or less? Um, so I think Lurus is just better because you get a 3-2 with lifelink that does more or less the same thing. Uh, but this could change. I wouldn't be surprised if that does change because this seems like a very powerful effect, but I think Lurus is just better. I think having a body on the field... Uh, especially the meta the way it is now, having cards on the battlefield is much better than not. And I, I guess this is on the battlefield, but it doesn't have any effect. It doesn't protect you. All it does is give you this ability, which Lurus does the same thing, and it's a body on the field. So I'm going to say zero here uh, because, because Lurus. We'll put a notes section uh, because Lurus. This could change. Mangara the Diplomat. Mangara the Diplomat is a 4-mana, 3 and a white, legendary creature, human cleric, with lifelink. Whenever an opponent attacks with creatures, if two or more of those creatures are attacking, you and or Planeswalkers you control draw a card. Whenever an opponent casts their second spell each turn, draw a card. It's a 2-4. It's a very interesting card. It's a mythic. Is this going to be a big player? I don't think so. 2-4 with lifelink isn't terrible. I mean, it would discourage people from attacking you that much more if they knew you were going to gain life. And the fact that you draw cards based on these conditions is pretty sweet, especially in white where card draw is like a necessity. I'd say if you want to craft one, that's fine. But I'm going to go zero. Well, the card draw is pretty sick. Whenever an opponent attacks with creatures, if two or more of those creatures are attacking and or, you and or Planeswalkers you control, draw a card. Whenever an opponent casts their second spell each turn, draw a card. I'm going to I'm gonna say one for this. Because, like, imagine imagine this in, like, a, a matchup against Flyers where they're just going to attack you and you get card draw and you can find answers. I think that's pretty good. And whenever they cast their second spell each turn, there are a lot of... There are a lot of conditions here that you could draw cards in white with and i think that's something white desperately needs so uh we'll go with one we'll yeah we'll do zero to one i think if, if you want to make your white deck better he is a great way to do that he's a little expensive but the card draws is just pretty good next is nine lives uh, I would say ca create four of these just for the art because it's absolutely adorable, but it's a three mana enchantment, one and two whites with hex proof. If a source uh, would deal damage to you, prevent that damage and put an incarnation counter on nine lives. When there are nine or more incarnation counters on nine lives, exile it. When nine lives leaves the battlefield, you lose the game. Um, I think that could see play in like control decks maybe, maybe as like a sideboard piece. Um, but I don't know. I mean, it, I'd say one craft one, you can put it in your sideboard. It might have some relevance and it might be something that later in the meta we see actually ends up being pretty good. Next, <coughs> sorry about that. Next card is Pack Leader. It's a two-mana dog creature. Other dogs you control get plus one, plus one. Whenever Pack Leader attacks, prevent all combat damage that would be dealt this turn to dogs you control. It's a two-two. Um, if you're going dog tribal, this is a four. Otherwise, I mean, if you're going, yeah, if if you're going dog tribal, obviously you want four of these, but four rares for, for your dog tribal deck, I mean, I don't think that that card sees play absolutely anywhere else. Um, so... For the sake of, like, yeah, I'm going zero. Unless, like, if you're going, you know, unless you're going dog tribal. But, like, he's only effective in your dog tribal deck. He's effective absolutely nowhere else. So, like, I wouldn't waste, I'm probably not going to waste any rares. Like, if I get him, that's cool, but I wouldn't go out and craft him. Next is Ruined Halo. It's a two-mana enchantment. Uh, as it enters the battlefield, choose a card name. You have protection from the chosen card name. Very solid sideboard card. I would say you can go out and craft one if you really want to. Um, maybe more. I would maybe two, even honestly, because that's a very solid sideboard card.
card, especially in white. You can just pick something and get protection from it. There's a lot of things you could name in a lot of the top meta decks that would just shut those things down. Um, so I think that that's, I, I think that that's a safe, safe bet. Speaker of the Heavens to one mana. Human Cleric. With Vigilance and Lifelink, you can tap it and create a 4-4 White Angel creature token with flying. Activate this ability only if you have at least 7 or more life, and then your starting life total, and only any time you could cast a Sorcery. He's a 1-1, one, one. so Life Gain just got a very solid 1-1, one, one, but he's extremely removable. Um, it wouldn't be that hard to get 7 extra life, I suppose, to start creating a 4-4 Angel, but he's just so removable. We're going zero. If you're playing life gain, he's a great addition, but I think he's even in life gain, he's just super removable and there are better ways to play. All right, next we're going into blue and we have Baron Tolarian Archmage. He is three mana, one and two blue. When he enters the battlefield, return up to one target creature or planeswalker uh, to its owner's hand at the beginning of your end step. If a permanent was put into your hand from the battlefield this turn, draw a card two, two. I think this card is sick. Um, and imagine having three mana on the board, you know, two hollowed fountains and a plains or a, an island. You already have Teferi out. You've bounced. Let's say your your opponent is unfortunate enough where their turn three, they only had one, one creature on the board. You bounced their one creature with Teferi. And you bounced. You already have bounced their creature with Teferi. You've drawn a card. Now you play Baron. And then it's their turn. They replay that creature that you bounced, and then that's pretty much their turn. Maybe they got another, and maybe they got another creature down. Maybe they're up to four lands. They have two creatures on the board, or maybe they maybe they're unlucky enough where they just had to put that one other creature, and they didn't have another play. Something along those lines. You replay Baron. You bounce to Fairy back to your hand, and then their next turn they attack with both creatures, or maybe they don't attack with both creatures. One is a one one, the other is a two two, and you take two damage. But then you replay to Fairy. You bounce. You could do the bouncing loops that you could. You could finagle with Baron and Teferi together. You can bounce your own thing back to your hand, draw a card because you bounce Teferi back to your hand. You bounce, you put Teferi back onto the battlefield. You bounce one of their things again. You draw a card again. I mean, it's just, I would say, I'm going to put this as a three, potentially four. I like that card a lot. I think like Azorius Control could really benefit from him. There are a lot of decks I think that he's he would be very good in. Um, so I'll put him at a three. Potentially even a four. Mm. Yeah, we'll put him at three. We'll put him at three because he's legendary. Obviously, you don't want to have... Like, four legendaries is sometimes a tough... Like, Uro is just that good that having four isn't a big deal. And Uro also has so many so much like value like you can just have a six six body and having four uros in exile that you can or in your graveyard that you can just like bring back like is never a bad situation to have especially if you replay one and it gets exiled or something you have three more that your opponent has to answer so like that's why uro i think having four uros isn't a big deal but like most legendaries like him i wouldn't you know four in one deck of four barons in one deck might be a bit much so that's why we're gonna keep him at three all right, next card is Discontinuity. It's a six mana, three and three blue instant. As long as it's your turn, this spell costs four, uh, I'm sorry, costs, yeah, four mana less to cast. Two colorless and two blues less. Two blues less. So if it's your turn, this costs two mana. And you could just end the turn. So like this and nine lives would be pretty interesting if it's if it's the turn that nine lives would exit the battlefield. You just end the turn, buy you some more time. Or if you play it on your opponent's turn, you just end their turn. I think that's a pretty powerful card. I think that's a very powerful card. At Mythic, we'll give it a two. Um, again, we're going to be more conservative at the beginning. Ghostly Pilfer. It's a two mana, two one. Whenever Ghostly Pilfer becomes untapped, you may pay two if you do draw a card. Whenever an opponent casts a spell from anywhere other than their hand, draw a card. Discard a card, and it can't be blocked this turn. Um, I think this card is better than people have been rating it. I've been seeing a lot of people saying that this is garbage. 
I think it's not that bad. There are a lot of clauses where you get to draw a card, and you can just discard a card. With all the card draw you have, you can just discard like a land, and it's a 2-1 that can't be blocked. I'm going to say 1, but I definitely think that this, this could be even better. All right. I think this card is underrated. So I'm going to say 1, but I think it could be could be more once week two comes around. Pursued Whale. It's a seven mana, five and two blue whale creature. When it enters the battlefield, each opponent creates a one one red pirate creature token with this creature can't block and creatures you control attack each combat if able. Um, spells your opponent cast that target Pursued Whale costs three more to cast. It's an eight eight. That last line of text, I think, put this over the top for me. I think it's a pretty good card. Um, you can, you can kind of clear their board, but it could kind of, you know, Creatures, creatures you control attack each combat if able could shoot you in the foot. Like having their creatures forced to attack you if you have, if they have a flyer you don't have an answer for yet, this could kind of shoot you in the foot. So this is a pretty situational card. Uh, but an 8-8 that you could help clear their board and that requires them to spend more mana to target, I think is a pretty solid card. So Ghostly Pilfer, what did we say? Oh, Discontinuity. Yeah, no. So this is... So Pursued Whale will go one. I don't think it's something that you're going to have four of. Um, and depending on your matchup, it could be a solid sideboard card. But I don't, you know, I don't think you should be spending four rare wild cards on Pursued Whale. I don't think it's going to be a meta shifter, so to speak. See the truth. Two mana. Look at the top three cards of your library, put one of those cards into your hand and the rest on the bottom of your library in any order. If this spell was cast from anywhere other than your hand, put each of those cards into your hand instead. So it's like anticipate, but it, that second clause. Anywhere other than your hand, put each of those cards into your hand instead. It's like anticipate, and maybe that last line of text makes it that much better in some way. But I'm going to go zero because I don't see anticipate anywhere. And this card, I'm going to have to like see it to believe it, to see like to see how people use that to make it that much better. How would you cast that from not your hand? Cast it from like the graveyard? If you mill it, but how would you cast it from the graveyard? I'd see, yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd have to see how people end up playing that to really see. Anyway, next card is Shacklegeist. It's a two mana, two two flying spirit. Can only block creatures with flying. Tap two, untap spirits you control, tap target creature you don't control. So like in a flyers deck, I guess this is pretty good, but uh, I'm gonna go zero because I just, you know, flyers is not top tier. Um, it has a lot of, you know, it's getting a lot of looks from Akoria and Shacklegeist, and there's another card. There's an uncommon in, in the, uh, in the multicolored that I think is pretty good, but like I don't I still don't think that they have enough. Storming Entity, it's a five mana, three and two blue, elemental creature. This spell costs three mana less, two and one blue less to cast. If you've cast an instant or sorcery spell this turn, so pretty good for is it. It's flying, it has prowess. When it enters the battlefield, scry two and it's a three three. That's all great. It's a little expensive for a three three body. But it does discount itself if you cast an instant or sorcery. So, like, in your Is It Spells deck, like, I think Prowess got a pretty good beef with, like, this and Jeskai Elder. Jeskai Elder, I think, isn't that good. And this card, I don't think, is that good. But, like, if you put these together and, like, if you're making, like, a Is It Prowess deck, I think it's pretty good. Um, is it going to be a meta changer? I don't think so. So I think we're going to go zero here. Um, but I think here, and I'll put in notes... So, like, this card isn't good, and it's not going to be a meta changer, but if you're making an Is It Prowet deck, I think that this is a solid inclusion, so you might want to actually craft it, but, like, I don't think you should really craft that card unless you're making that kind of deck. Sublime Epiphany is our next card. 
It's a six mana, four and two blue. Choose one or more. Counter target spell, counter target activated or triggered ability. Return target non-land permanent to its owner's hand. Create a token that's a copy of a target creature you control. Target player draws a card. Um, so essentially, Casualties of War, but for blue. I love Casualties of War. I think that this is going to be... Mm. I think this could potentially be a very, very, very influential card. But I would make this a four, but because it's expensive and because we haven't seen it in play yet, I'm going to go two just from the get-go. Because I think you'd be safe having two of these. It's a little bit expensive and it might be just be a throw and Maybe you cut Casualties of War out of your Saltai deck and you put that in instead. Um, you know, if you have four copies of Casualties of War, you cut one out and you put this in instead, I think you're safe. And I think having two is fine because you can also put it in control decks. I think this has a place in a lot of different decks and I think it's a very powerful card. I think it would be a safe four of, but we're going to do two just to, just to see because you never know. Could be an absolute flop. Next card is Teferi, Master of Time. It's a four mana, two and two blue, legendary planeswalker. You can activate his abilities anytime you could cast an instant. He has plus one draw a card, then discard a card. So it gets hosed by Narset. Minus three target creature, you don't control phases out, which I don't really know how powerful phasing is gonna be. Minus 10, take two extra turns after this one, which is extremely powerful, and he starts at three. Um, starts at three loyalty, he's a mythic. <clears throat> I think it's a really powerful card, but it's where does this find a home in the meta? <sighs> well, Narset is still a thing. Obviously, his plus one means nothing. His plus one is just do nothing. Add a loyalty counter to this Planeswalker is basically what his plus one is, as long as Narset is on the field. And Narset is pretty prevalent. If you're playing like Azorius Control, which has kind of fallen off, it gets hosed. If you're playing Sultai Ramp, it gets hosed. If you're playing... Any sort of Jess guy, if people are still playing that, which they aren't really, it gets hosed. If you're playing, what are people playing with Yorian? <clears throat> I guess if you're playing like Yorian control, which is still just Azorius control. He could have a home in some places. I would say you can, you'd be safe crafting one. And I think if you get, like there's a certain pre-order where you get one anyway. Um, I think one is safe. This definitely potentially could be a major player, especially, you know, post rotation. Once Narset leaves, could be huge. So you might want to have more for pre root. You know, you might want to craft all four so that when rotation happens, he's that much better. But Teferi's Ageless Insight. It's a four mana, two and two blue. If you would draw a card, except the first one you draw in each of your draw steps, draw two cards instead. We're going zero. Um, I don't think that an enchantment, I don't think a legendary enchantment that costs four mana, just because you're drawing extra cards. I think if, if you already have card draw, like as part of your game plan, I think you're probably drawing enough cards where like drawing an extra one wouldn't matter. You could really take this over the top with like Teferi and with like a, what's that, uh, Thirst for Meaning and stuff. You could really take it over the top, but like if card draw is your thing, I think you already probably have enough of it where like this really, spending four mana to play this is really, a four mana does nothing until you trigger it, I think isn't really that good. All right, so moving on to our black cards. We have Demonic Embrace. It's a three mana, one and two black enchantment aura. Uh, enchanted creature gets plus three, plus one, has flying, and is a demon in addition to its other types. You may cast Demonic Embrace from the graveyard by paying three life and discarding a card in each, uh, in addition to paying its other costs. I really like it, but I don't think you should go out crafting this for your, you know, if you're playing an auras deck, which I, you know, Orzov Auras was kind of a thing for a second when that Mono White Weenie Shield Maiden deck came out and people started kind of crafting off of it, but I think the Mono White version was always just like the best version. Um, and I mean, with can you recur this with Luris? No, because it's three mana. But you could recur it with that like icon of endurance. So like maybe this becomes a player, but like from the get-go, I don't I don't think it is. This next card, Grim Tutor, another three mana, uh, another three mana black card, one and two black. 
sorcery search your library for a card put that card into your hand then shuffle your library you lose three life i don't know enough about tutoring from what i hear people are hyped about this card because it was really good at a certain point in magic's history or it was a very popular card i suppose um i haven't really seen tutoring like we have idyllic tutor and nobody plays that but it was for an enchantment and this is for any any card but i i really don't think that like off the get-go i don't think tutoring is like a big deal especially in the current meta that we have um we'll see you know i might learn something about this you know i might learn how this is a very good card in the near future something that just fetches you a card that you need you know if that's in your starting hand that's great but like all the top meta decks i don't really see where this finds a place like salt high ramp like you're probably with Uro, you're drawing enough, and with Hydroid Crisis, you're drawing enough cards where, like, I don't, you know, if you need something, and with, like, if you have Tamiyo, you can you can mill. Like, you, finding the cards you need is not that hard in Sultai Ramp and other top-tier decks. I don't, like, what, you're going to put this in your mono black aggro deck to, like, look for, like, if you, you main deck an Obosh or something? Like, I don't, I just don't see it, Chief. Hooded Blightfang. Three mana, two and a black, snake creature with death touch. Whenever a creature you control with death touch attacks, each opponent loses one life and you gain one life. Whenever a creature you control with death touch deals damage to a planeswalker, destroy that planeswalker. It is a 1-4. Uh, I'm going to go zero on this one. Uh, if you're making like a death touch tribal deck, I mean, it's solid, but like death touch tribal is a non-factor in the current meta. Um, so if you're, if you're playing death touch tribal this is a great card craft four of them but if you're not playing and if you have the extra wild cards but um i don't think that this is going to be a game changer by any stretch of the imagination next is Kervik the spiteful it's four mana two and two black other creatures uh get other creatures so not even other creatures your you know other creatures your opponent it is just other creatures other than him all get minus one minus one he's a three two uh I'm going to go zero. I just, I don't see, I mean, if he, he'd be a decent, like, sideboard in black if you're coming up against, like, a Cavalcade of Calamity, but nobody plays Cavalcade of Calamity, at least not, like, seriously. It's not a top-tier meta deck. It's for tryhards who can't make the mono-red, you know, they can't make, like, the true mono-red deck. They just play Cavalcade of Calamity until I think they have enough wild cards to make the true mono-red. Um, Liliana Waker of the Dead, four mana, two and two black legendary planeswalker she starts with four loyalty her plus one each player discards a card each opponent who can't loses three life her minus three target creature gets minus x minus x until end of turn where x is the number of cards in your graveyard her minus seven you get an emblem with at the beginning of combat uh your turn put target creature from a graveyard onto the battlefield under your control it gains haste could have a place in like sultai i th I'm going to go one because I like the card and I think it could be a good card, but I don't think it's strong enough. Uh, I think what it does isn't good enough, but I could be wrong. Um, yeah. Next is Liliana's Standard Bearer. It's a three mana, two and a black zombie knight creature with flash. When it enters the battlefield, draw X cards where X is the number of creatures that died under your control this turn. It's a 3-1. Kind of like Blacklands Paragon, except it gets you card draw. Nobody really plays Blacklands Paragon anymore. I mean, in your flash deck, it would be great. I think Demir Flash could benefit from that card. But Demir Flash was a complete bust in Akoria, so zero. Next is Massacre Worm. Six mana, three, and three black worm creature. When it enters the battlefield, creatures your opponent's control get minus two, minus two until end of turn. Uh, whenever an opponent, con uh, whenever a creature an opponent controls dies, that player loses two life. It's a six five. I really like this card. I just, when would giving all of your opponent's creatures minus two, minus two really be relevant? If you're playing, no, nobody plays their, if you're playing against Lurus and Lurus is on the battlefield, it kills Lurus. But nobody plays Lurus anymore. He's just like a sideboard card in cycling. Um, what other decks 
have like one one two two creatures. I mean, this could clear up the board against mono red, but mono red's kind of a non-factor anymore. You will see it on the ladder. So I mean, maybe Massacre Worm is a solid sideboard card, but it costs six mana. So the the odds you get to six mana before mono red has kind of messed you up. And once they get an annex on the board, this doesn't clear annex. Makes annex easier to kill for one turn. So I'd say craft one. Solid side, solid mythic card, solid sideboard card, solid card if it, it, it's in the right matchup, but the odds you're in the right matchup for that card are slim to none. Well, slim. Not to none. Just slim. Next is Peer into the Abyss. Uh, it's seven mana, four and three black. Target player draws cards equal to half the number of cards in their library and loses half their life round up each time. Uh, this is a zero until it can prove to me that it's actually worth anything. I think this is like a combo jank card. And if you want to go combo jank, go ahead and craft it. But like week one, if you're trying to craft cards that you think are going to be like relevant, I would say don't craft that. Thieves Guild Enforcer. It's a one mana, one one with flash. Whenever uh, Thieves Guild Enforcer or another rogue enters the battlefield under your control, each opponent mills two cards. Uh, as long as an opponent has eight or more cards in their graveyard, Thieves Guild Enforcer gets plus two, plus one, and has Death Touch. Milling is kind of milling your opponent is kind of a bad thing right now because of the prevalence of Uro and things that have escape. So I'm gonna go zero. Um, yeah. <laughs> Next is Vito, Thorn of the Dusk Rose. It's a three mana vampire cleric. Whenever you gain life target opponent loses that much life. And then for five mana, three and two black creatures you control gain lifelink until end of turn. He's a one, three, a zero again. Lifelink has never been a meta deck or a meta archetype. Uh, if, you, if you're making a lifelink deck that's Orzhov colors, go absolutely ahead. Otherwise, Absolutely not. He's not going to be any sort of game changer. Um, might have been a little too lenient with white, but I am interested to see where these cards end up. So maybe like Bosri's Lieutenant should just be a zero. Glorious Anthem, I think it'd still be a one. Mangara should just be a zero. It's probably a little too lenient when we started. It was a little too optimistic, but yeah, a lot of these cards should have just been straight up zero. All right. Brash Taunter. Brash Taunter is a 5 mana 4 and a red indestructible 1-1. One, one. Whenever Brash Taunter is dealt damage, it deals that much damage to target opponent. For 3 mana, 2 and a red, you can tap it. It fights another target creature. It's a very interesting card. Cavalcade loves this. It's indestructible whenever it's so you just you have a permanent blocker that like whenever it deals damage you do damage to an opponent so yeah cavalcade loves that card but again cavalcade is a non-factor and f five mana for a one one zero you could make some interesting decks with it but it's not going to be a mover or a shaker I, I can tell you that and five mana for a one one i mean by the time cavalcade of calamity is those decks are, are where they want to be it's just you don't want to be spending five mana on a 1-1. One, one. Okay, Chandra Heart of Fire. <clears throat> on a 1-1 one, one, that is indestructible, though, so you can shut down. If they have anything low to the ground that's trying to attack you, you can shut it down. But anyway, regardless. Chandra, Heart of Fire. Five mana, three and two red, legendary planeswalker. Her plus, she starts with five loyalty. Plus one, discard your hand, then exile the top three cards of your library. Until end of turn, you may play those cards exiled this way. She is another plus one. Deals two damage to any target, so she is a, essentially shock for plus one and then a minus nine search your graveyard or library for any number of red instant and or sorcery cards exile them then shuffle your library you may cast them uh this turn add six red mana um maybe craft one if you're playing like mono red mono red burn mono red burn is hasn't been a thing for a long time um I'm I have her at zero. Do I want to keep her at zero is my question. I 
Yeah, I, I think I think I keep her at zero. Chandra's Incinerator. It's a six mana, five and one red elemental. This spell costs X less to cast where X is the total amount of non-combat damage dealt to your opponents this turn. It has Trample. Whenever a source you control deals non-combat damage to an opponent, it's incinerator, uh, Chandra's Incinerator deals that much damage to target creature or planeswalker that opponent controls, that player controls. It looks like Mono Red Burn is getting a lot of toys, so like all of this could change. Like all like Incinerator, Double Vision, Fire Emancipation, Chandra, Chandra's Incinerator, all this stuff. If Mo Mono Red Burn could be making a comeback, but people are gonna have to craft that deck, or, or I'm gonna have to brew. People are gonna have to brew and make it blatantly obvious that it's a good deck before I tell you to go and craft these cards. Um. Because like that, Fire Emancipation, Double Vision, Chandra, like all Brash Taunter, all of these things kind of work together and are good. Fi Volcanic Salvo, like all these things I think are good, but like I really would have to see it to believe it. Conspicuous Stoop. Snoop, two red mana, Goblin Rogue. Play with the top card of your library revealed. You may play Goblin spells from the top of your library as long as the top card of your library is a Goblin card. Conspicuous Snoop has all activated abilities of that card. It's a 2-2. Goblins has never been, it isn't a thing. Double Vision. It's a five mana, three, and two red enchantment. Whenever you cast your first instant or sorcery spell each turn, copy that spell. You may choose new targets for the copy. Um, so like, Stormwing Entity. Like, this would be good in, like, a Stormwing Entity deck with Jeskai Elder and stuff. Like, and is it? And I think it's an interesting enough enchantment where I think crafting one of these to play around with it wouldn't be, the, like, the dumbest thing in the world. Um, same thing with this card, Fire Emancipation. It's a six mana enchantment. If a source you control would deal damage to a permanent or planeswalker, it deals triple that damage to that permanent or player instead. I would say craft one and just, like, play around with it. I don't think that these are going to be like top tier meta, but like I feel like if you craft these and then play around with like mono red burn, you could like figure something out that would be kind of awesome. But I don't think you should be going spending every wild card you have on those cards. They're pretty mana intensive, and I don't think that they really are going to be changing that much. Gadrak, the Crown Scorch. It's a three mana, two and a red, legendary dragon with flying. When uh, it can't attack unless you control four or more artifacts. At the beginning of your end step, create a treasure token for each non creature that non token creature that died this turn. It's a five four. Um, meh. I don't think that that's doing much to be honest. Sabira Tolzidi Caravaner. It's three mana, uh, two and a red human shaman with haste for one mana. Another target creature with power two or less can't be blocked. And then for two mana and tapping it, you can discard your hand until end of turn whenever a creature you control with power two or less deals combat damage to a player, draw a card, two, three. I don't see, I don't, I, it's an interesting card, but I don't know what deck it gets included in. Terror of the Peaks, five mana, three and two red, dragon creature with flying, spells your opponent's cast that target Terror of the Peaks costs an additional three life to cast. Whenever an, another creature enters the battlefield under your control, Terror of the Peaks deals damage equal to that creature creature's power to any target it's a 5-4 um so if any of you recall when fires of invention got banned one of the reasonings behind its ban was that in future testing there were cards that made it more or less people more or less wizards said that there were cards that made it broken i think this card absolutely would break the fires of invention like the jeskai fires deck that was popular with cavalier of flame and all that stuff this would totally break that and i think this is one of the cards that they they can like that that was brought up when banning fires of invention imagine playing this and then like you you, you play fires of invention you get your fifth land and then you play this and then on your next turn you play Cavalier of Flame, assuming, right, do you need a you need another land for Cav, potentially? You play another land for Cavalier, and then you play, like, I don't know, you could play anything. You could play two Cavaliers. You could play a Cavalier and a Sphinx of Foresight. You could play Cavalier and a Bone Crusher Giant. You could play Cavalier and another one of these, like, and then it's doing six damage for Cav, 
and then it's doing four damage for Sphinx, four damage for Bone Crusher Giant, six five damage for Kenrith. Um, you know, it's I think that this card would have broken that, and I think that's one of the reasons Fires of Invention. I think this is one of the cards that they were testing that if you played this with Fires of Invention, it was just too much. I think Fires of Invention was already an incredibly powerful deck, and I think this would have put it over the top. I really like this card. Um, but another thing... So without Fires of Invention, this card becomes a little weaker, because I think with Fires of Invention, this card is incredible. Without it, it's kind of meh. It is good. It is very good. Um, but spells your opponent's cast that target it cost three additional life. If this had... if If a... If a because this gets hosed by Teferi, like if if this if this included abilities, this card would be that much better. Like if they had to pay three life to bounce this with Teferi, they get the card draw. I think it would have been better. Um, and you know there are things that you can just they can tap this card, but I think the second line of text obviously is is extremely powerful. But I mean, Heartless Act just gets rid of it, and I would pay three life. With Heartless Act, I would pay two mana and three life to get rid of this. Rid of this with Heartless Act in a heartbeat. Um, Tyrant Scorn sends us back to hand for three life. So I guess that's not the best thing in the world. It is a very good card. I think it's a little susceptible to removal um, and you know bouncing and just general disruption, but it is powerful. It is certainly a powerful card. Um, we'll go one because I think that like that's definitely a game ender like Dracuseth but like how often do you see Dracuseth you know like not a lot of people play it and there's a reason for that and I think that, that those same reasons would apply to Terror of the Peaks it's a great card and I think the art is dope and I think the abilities are dope but it's the same thing as Dracuseth I just don't think people don't play that card and Generally, I mean, there are reanimator decks and stuff, but no top tier meta decks play it. So I think you'd be safe crafting one, and I think you'd be fine there. Next is Transmogrify. It's a four mana, three, and a red sorcery, exile target creature. That creature's controller reveals cards from the top of their library until they reveal a creature card. That player puts that card on the battlefield, shuffles the library. This is garbage. Absolute trash cabbage garbage. Volcanic Salvo. 10 and 2 red sorcery. This spell costs X less to cast, where X is the total power of creatures you control. Deal 6 damage to each of up to 2 target creatures and or planeswalkers. You can craft one of these, I guess. If you're playing Big Red, this is an awesome card. Big Red isn't a thing. Big Red could be a thing for a bit. I mean, if you're playing like a cool, if you're playing a non-fires Cavalier of Flame and like tr Terror of the Peaks and Dracoseth, if you're playing Big Red, this could be dope, but like Big Red, again, isn't a thing, and Big Red costs a lot of mana to play, so. I think, so like Terror of the Peaks, Volcanic Salvo, could be like Gruul, you could, I mean, it has Gruul written all over it, so maybe, maybe like Gruul is where these things see play now that Fires of Invention isn't a thing. Maybe Gruul sees, Vol uh, Gruul probably has better removal than Volcanic Salvo, but. I think Volcanic Salvo could be really good with Gruul because Gruul has a lot of high, you know, four four power and higher creatures. So, you know, you have a Questing Beast out there and a ter Terror of the Peaks. If you ramp into those things, then all of a sudden that's nine mana paid for. You call you have a three mana Volcanic Salvo. That's insane. Assuming, assuming your Questing Beast and your ter Terror of the Peaks don't get removed. Again, those things are extremely susceptible to removal. Anyway. Next, we are going into green. Azusa, Lost But Seeking. So a three mana, two and a green. You may play two additional lands on each of your turns. It's a one, two. This gets killed. This is just too vulnerable to removal. Um, and how often are you going to have two lands in your hand? You'd have to find out. You'd have to find some sort of combination. This is like a combo card and combo decks. You, we'll have to figure out what combo decks become important for this to be a relevant card because super susceptible to removal and how often are you going to have two lands in your hand that you're going to be able to play. Elder Gargaroth. This is another great high power, high toughness creature, but paying five mana for a thing that doesn't do anything until it attacks or blocks and is super susceptible to removal is pretty weak. I really, really like it, but I wish 
it was like when it was targeted create a or gain or draw but really this is just like dies to heartless act dies to casualties of war dies to bounce you know gets bounced by teferi gets exiled by elspeth conquers death so we'll say one and like if you're making some sort of like mono green deck could be an, an inclusion uh but i think it's just in the current meta this is it just gets hit by everything next is feline sovereign two and a green other cats you control get plus one plus one and have protection from dogs whenever one or more cats you control deal combat damage to a player destroy up to one target artifact or enchantment that player controls it's two three very solid card if you're doing cat tribal but cat tribal i don't think is going to be a thing so zero next is garuk unleashed it's four mana two and two green mythic planeswalker or I should say legendary planeswalker it's plus one up to one target creature you control gets plus three plus three and gains trample until end of turn Minus two, create a 3-3 three, three green beast creature token. If an opponent controls more creatures than you, put a loyalty counter on Karuk Unleashed. Sorry, my reading just got, like, elementary grade there. Uh, his minus seven, you get an emblem with at the beginning of your end step, you may search your library for a creature card, put that card onto the battlefield, then shuffle your library. He starts with four loyalty. Um, I love Garuk, and I have a lot of... Garuk, Garuk decks, so I would say four because I love him, but we'll say one. He could find a place. I mean, this is just better. Like, if you're playing Saltai, if you if you want to include a green Planeswalker in Saltai, you put Nissa. He could have a place in some other decks, and I think, you know, his plus one is nothing to scoff at, giving another creature plus three, plus three, and trample. But I don't think he's... He's like a mover and a shaker of the meta at all. I mean, Nissa who shakes the wars. I mean, Nissa literally shakes things up, shook everything up. She's an amazing planeswalker, and he's just... If you want a green planeswalker, go Nissa. Don't go Garuk, unfortunately. Garuk's Harbinger. Three mana, one and two green, hexproof from black. Whenever Garuk's Harbinger deals combat damage to a player or planeswalker, look at that uh, Look at that many cards from the top of your library. You may reveal a creature card or a Garuk planeswalker card from among them and put them into your hand. Put the rest on the bottom of your library in any random or in, in, yeah, in a random order. 4-3. Um, this is zero. I wouldn't go out crafting this. Heroic Intervention. Two mana, one and a green. Permanence you control gain hexproof and indestructible until end of turn. Uh, fantastic card, great sideboard card. I'd say two. Having two of these uh, for a sideboard thing, you know, if you know you need protection from stuff to give your creatures, uh, you know, hexproof or protection just in general, I think that's solid. Jolrail Mwanvuli Recluse. Jolrail Mwanvuli Recluse. Two mana, one and a green, legendary creature, human druid. Whenever you draw your second card each turn, create a 2 2 green cat creature token. For six mana, four and two green. Until end of turn, creatures you control have a base power and toughness of X and X, where X, X, yeah, X and X, where X is the number of cats in your hand. It's a one, two, zero. Anything cats and dogs is pretty much zero until you can prove to me that those cards, that those decks are going to be any good. Primal Might, for X and a green, target creature you control gets X plus X plus X until end of turn, then it fights up to one target creature you don't control. I think this is... So there are a lot of fight cards. What is it like? Is it Rabid Bite? Or does Rabid Bite just deal damage? As far as fight cards go, I think this is an improvement on fight cards because you can decide how much more mana you want to spend to get your creature to fight something else and you can protect it from death. But it's just not better than like Ram, like, you know, something that just deals damage equal to the power of your creature to something else. I'll say one because I like it better than some of the fight cards that are out there, but I think they're, you know, I think that there's better options out there for you. Next is Scavenging Ooze. Two mana, one and a green ooze creature. For one green mana, exile target card from a graveyard. That is amazing. If it was a creature card, put a plus one, plus one counter on Scavenging Ooze, and you gain one life. It is a two, two. I, this is a four for me. Right now, this is just such a good card in the meta. You can get rid of cats if your opponent is stupid enough to leave them in the graveyard. You play this and they, they don't bring it back. Or maybe you can kind of figure out a way to remove their food so they can't bring the cat back. And then you target it with this and you just shut that, shut that down. Um, targets Uro. 
you know, if they play an Uro on turn three, you draw into this, and before they can exile stuff to bring Uro back, you just cast this down, catch their Uro, boom. And then they don't want to, all their Uros are dead. All their Uros in their hand, as long as this is on the battlefield and they don't have they don't have it removed, their Uros are dead in hand as soon as they draw them. And then if they remove this and then they replay an Uro, all you have to do is get another two mana 2-2 two, two onto the battlefield and, and remove it. I, uh, yeah, that's a four for me. I think in the current meta that this is a very strong card. Spore Web Weaver, two mana, or I'm sorry, three mana, two and a green. Spider Creature, one four. Reach Hexproof from blue. Whenever Spore Web Weaver, Weaver is dealt damage, you gain one life and create a one one green sapperling creature token. Zero. Spiders have like never been a thing. All right. Next is Niambi, Esteemed Speaker. It's a uh, white and a blue with flash. It's a 2-1. When she enters the battlefield, you may return another target creature you control to its... Another target creature you control to its owner's hand. If you do, you gain life equal to that creature's converted mana cost. That's pretty interesting. And then for three mana, one, a white and a blue, you can tap it, discard a legendary card, draw two cards. I don't hate that card. I don't hate that card at all. I mean, it definitely, I'm going to give it a one, but like, we'll see where that ends up. I don't think it's like the best card ever. I don't think it's going to be a mover or shaker, but like, I think it has its places. I think it has its utilities. Radha, Heart of Keld, three mana, one, a red and a green. As long as it's your turn, she has first strike on a three, three. That's pretty good. You may look at the top card of your library anytime. You may play lands from the top of your library, and then for six mana, four, a red and a green, she gets plus X, plus X until end of turn, where X is the number of lands you control. So kind of like a beanstalk giant, if you pay six mana. And first strike is pretty insane. First strike is insane on a 3-3, three, three, so we'll give it a one. And then Sanctum of All. Uh, Sanctum of All costs one of each color, so it's a five mana, one of each color. Shrine, at the beginning of your upkeep, you may search your library and or graveyard for a shrine card and put it onto the battlefield. If you search your library this way, shuffle it. If an ability of another shrine you control triggers while you control six or more shrines, that ability triggers an additional time. I don't think shrines are going to be a thing, so zero. Next is Ugin the Spirit Dragon, eight mana. Plus two, deals three damage to any target. Minus X, exile each permanent with converted mana cost X or less. That's one or more colors. And then minus 10, you gain seven life, draw seven cards, and then put up to seven permanent cards from your hand onto the battlefield. Starts with seven mana. I think there are going to be a lot of decks that ramp into this. So I'd say I'm going to put this as a four. Yeah, I'm going to put this as a four. I think, yeah, we'll put that as a four. It's a very powerful card. And I think a lot of decks are going to be looking to ramp into that. And we'll see if it pays off. We'll see if they actually do. But next is Chromatic Orrery. Seven mana. You may spend mana as though or mana of any color. You can tap it and add five colorless mana. And then for five mana, you can tap it and draw a card for each color among permanents you control. That's a zero. I don't think that that's going to... It's just too expensive. Um, Maze Mind Tome. Two mana, artifact, tap it, put a page counter on Maze Mind Tome, scry one. Two mana, tap it, draw a card, and put a page counter on it. When there are four or more page counters on Maze Mind Tome, exile it, you gain four life. I'll give this a one. I think the, like, the more I read that card, the more I liked it, and I think it could find a place in certain decks. I, again, I don't think it's a mover or a shaker, but I definitely think it's a solid, solid piece to a lot of decks. Solemn simulacrum four mana when it enters the battlefield you may search your library for a basic land card put that card on the battlefield tapped and then shuffle your library when it dies you may draw a card it's a two two could be used for ramp but i think there's just better ramp out there so i'm going to put it as a zero and then our last artifact is spark hunter masticore three mana as an additional cost to cast a spell discard a card it has protection from planeswalkers take that to fairy for one mana it deals one mana uh, deals one damage to target planeswalker for three mana gains indestructible until end of turn it is a three four um i like protection from planeswalkers 
but we're going to give that a zero for now. I just don't know if that's going to see play at all. Uh, or if, you know, if that benefit is as good as it really, you know, protection from Teferi, is that really that important when Teferi is going to be rotating soon? Don't go out and craft four, maybe craft one as a sideboard piece, but I'm going to say zero for now. We'll see. And then the rest of the cards are all lands. Animal Sanctuary. It's a land. Tap it to add one colorless mana. For two mana, you can tap it, put a plus one, plus one counter on a bird, cat, dog, goat, ox, or snake. If you're playing any of those kinds of decks, go ahead and craft it, but I would say zero for now. Fabled Passage. Everybody's probably familiar with this. It's a land. You can tap it, sacrifice it, search your library for a basic land card, and put it under the battlefield tapped, then shuffle your library. If you uh, control four or more lands, untap that land. Untap that land. So... If you don't already have it, craft it. If you do already have it, don't craft it. Plain and simple. And then I'm going to be honest, for the rest of these, so the rest of these are all temples, and I think they're, are they the allied or the, no, they're the uh, enemy colored temples. So like Temple of Epiphany, which is red-blue, Temple of Malady, which is uh, black-green, Temple of Mystery, which is blue-green. Please be right, yep. Uh, Temple of Silence, which is uh, Orzov, or black-white. And then Temple of Triumph, which is uh, white-red. Yeah. So, you're going to want these cards eventually. They are Scryland, so they're a little bit weaker. But, like, I'd say you you, wanna, you want all these. Eventually, you're going to want all these. Um, yeah, eventually you're going to want all of them. Having two of each is probably fine, but eventually you're going to want all four just to have them. Um, so I could, we could drop these all down to two, but for now, I mean, we'll just keep them at four. So let's see. Let's see what the total is. I said, let's see what the total is. Total crafts is 20. Total crafts is 61. <laughs> so that's a lot. Mind you, if I really wanted to whittle this down, if I really wanted to whittle this down, I would say craft, ab if you're going to craft, craft absolutely nothing other than maybe Baron. Scavenging ooze and the lands and Ugin. So if, if you if if we wanted to whittle this down to what I think is gonna be worth crafting on day one, I think Ugin is gonna be So let's do equals sum Ugin the lands. Scavenging ooze, no. Scavenging ooze. And you know what? That's it. Because we don't even know what, what Baron's going to do. 30. Whoops. 32. So yeah, that, that's my recommendation. My true recommendation... So if... Some of these are kind of like iffy, you know, ones if you want to, you know, they might be good, they might not be good. If you want my true recommendation on what I think you should absolutely have crafted day one, if you don't already have stuff like the lands and stuff, obviously all the lands, but like aside from the lands, Ugin, I would say a four of is what you want. Scavenging Ooze as a four of, I think you want, and I think that's it, honestly. And then save the rest for week two. Once we'll go over it again and and kind of revisit all this. Um, but I think this is these are all safe bets. If you want some of these other ones, like at threes and twos and ones, go ahead. These are just kind of like you know, if you have spare wild cards and maybe you're playing with certain decks, you know, go ahead and give it a shot, um, and see how it goes. Uh, but 
for the rest. Oh, actually, so we can just delete. Okay, delete this column. We'll delete this column. Um, yeah, so we'll just, uh, yeah, so that's it. So that's the number. And then, yeah, so this is, these are the conservative numbers. If you want to craft some of the one of some of the two of's go ahead. But like, I, you know, I, I, those are just, if you're testing out certain decks, if you have certain decks that, you know, maybe you want to try out some of these new cards. If you have the spare wild cards, I guess is what I'm saying. If you have the spare wild cards and you're playing with certain decks and you want to try out some of these cool new cards or cool new reprints or whatever, cool reprints, whatever, go ahead and spend the wild cards. But if my bare minimum, my bare minimum recommendation would be to make four scavenging ooze and four Ugin spirit dragons, because I think those are going to be huge cards. I have a very strong feeling that those are going to be huge cards in the current meta. The rest of them are kind of all up in the air. Maybe they will, maybe they won't. Some of them are just for fun. Uh, but I think those are strong. And obviously these lands are really important. Fabled Passage, I think, is your is your most important one that you're going to want. So like Ugin the Spirit Dragon, Scavenging Ooze, and Fabled Passage, those are 12 cards. Day one, I can tell you, you are going to want. The rest of the temples, you you know, you could probably have two of and get by with just fine because you don't want too many scry lands in, in any given deck. So like if you have two of each of them, you're probably fine. But eventually you're probably going to want to have all four just for the sake of having, you know, for OCD sake and having all four in your collection. Um, but in the rest of them, again, if you have the wild cards and you're playing, you know, you want to make it craft a deck or brew a deck that has these cards included, I think these are safe numbers to kind of abide by. Um, but yeah, I mean, you know, we'll revisit all this in week, you know, two weeks after. So let's see. It comes out on the 25th. So we'll revisit this on July 9th. We'll revisit everything. We'll go over kind of where the meta has settled, if the meta has settled, um, and go from there. We'll see, you know, maybe how many we think at that point we should craft. You know, some of these might be fours, some of these might be zeros again. Uh, for all I know, Ugin could be a zero. I don't think he will be. I think he's an extremely powerful card, and I think people are going to make, you know, and put him as a solid inclusion in a lot of decks. Um, but... You know, some of this could change, and we'll see where it goes. Um, we will probably be a little bit more aggressive, and you know, once the meta settles, on and you know, some of these cards are seeing play. Most of these cards aren't seeing play. You know, we'll put fours next to those that are seeing a lot of play, and we'll put zeros next to those that aren't seeing any play. Uh, and then in the final outcome, you know, at the at the end of the rotation, sometime in September or October, we'll go over everything over again and just kind of see where everything lands. But these are my kind of predictions. These are my recommendations for launch day. Um, and yeah. So yeah, if you have the wild cards to spend, go out and spend them. Are you looking forward to Corset 2021? I am. I want to see kind of where, where things are going to settle. I unfortunately think that none of the cards in Corset 2021 are going to be enough to really move or shake the meta. I think Team of Reclamation, I think we're going to have another three months before everything starts rotating. That Team of Reclamation is still going to be top dog. Um, I don't think any of these cards bring anything else into the forefront, but I'm interested to see. Maybe, maybe it does. Maybe they do. Who knows? Um, we only have to wait a, another couple weeks to find out um, again. So, you know, if, if you liked this, let me know if you're, you know, if you, if you want, uh, if you want to recraft sooner than two weeks after everything settles, let me know. Uh, but two weeks is kind of my target right now. So July 9th, uh, I'll probably do another video uh, and we'll do kind of a, a crafting guide after the meta settles. And then again, sometime September and October, we'll go over the final outcome for crafting numbers. So yeah, thank you for joining. We'll catch you in the next one.